Yeah, I have started. Great. Okay. Can everybody see the first slide? I can see it, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Good. Now let's see if we can turn pages. <laughs> My title is Universal Equivalent Circuit for All Antennas. Um, I gave this talk originally to the Foothills Amateur Radio Society last summer. I expanded it and gave it again at ARRL Pacificon in October, and I've expanded it again and made it a little bit more technical for this presentation tonight to both the Antenna and Propagation Society and MTTS. And I want to thank you, thank you for inviting me uh, to your joint meeting. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be here. Um, I realize joint meetings are very hard to schedule and on Zoom, it's <laughs> there are additional complications. Uh, so hopefully we'll get through this. I have to find out which buttons will tr change my slides. Right now, none of them seem to be doing that. So are you sharing your screen or the... Uh, I'm sharing the screen. Yeah, so you should be able to just uh, advance the slides like you would in the application. You know, normally. Let's, let's hit escape. There we go. I didn't do anything. Oh, I hit the mouse. Maybe the mouse is what advances them. Okay. Yeah, the forward and backward arrows aren't working, but the mouse maybe is working. So let's see. The topics, I'm going to do a little bit on the Smith chart. There's a very good tutorial on the MTTS uh, website. Uh, two one is a presentation. The other is a paper. Uh, there's no need for me to review the Smith chart with this audience. Uh, there was with the amateur audience, but with the this audience, I don't need to say much about the Smith chart, but I will give a few little known facts about the Smith chart that may surprise some. I'm gonna give a, a very brief uh, review of classical network theory. That's a big subject on itself and it forms the basis for what I'm talking about tonight. So I'll say, I'll give a little bit on that. Uh, we'll talk a lot, lot about impedance functions, what they are, what their properties are. Um, and then equivalent circuits, I'll go into the simple narrow band equivalent circuits that are commonly used. And then I'll go into some broadband circuits that are not so good and explain why. And then I'll present universal equivalent circuits and finally give, I have a lot of examples, probably too many for our time allotment. Uh, I do need to know how much time I have. It looks like we're on a different, we're not on an unlimited version of Zoom. So um, this presentation normally would be given in about an hour, and I think we have maybe 40 minutes. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, so let's see if we can move ahead. Well, uh, Dr. Stearns, I, my suggestion is uh, that we sort of anticipate the 40 minute break that apparently will be inevitable because of some update issues on the account. And then I apologize to the audience, but what it was successful for, for everyone to rejoin. Uh, after, so what you know, let's, let's, uh, let's plan on that. Is that all right? That's fine with me. Yeah. So if this meeting goes uh, dark, uh, we'll just uh, take a short break and then we can be. Thank uh, you. Okay. The Smith chart. The Smith chart was developed by Philip Smith at uh, Bell Telephone Laboratories. He published it in 1936. Uh, it was originally shown in this configuration on the right. Uh, where the zero point is at the zero impedance is at the top of the chart, infinity impedance is at the bottom of the chart. And of course, the outer boundary is the unit resistance, zero resistance circle. Um, and the match point, normalized resistance equal to zero, normalized reactance equal to zero is the center. Uh, Philip Smith died in 1987. Mrs. Smith held the copyright to the chart. She sold it to the IEEE. Microwave Theory and Technique Society in 2015, and it became the basis for the logo for IMS 2016. Um, of course, the Smith chart is found everywhere. It's found on drinks, coasters, uh, T-shirts. Uh, so I don't know how the IEEE is going to defend its copyright, but <laughs> the Smith chart is out there, and it's out there to stay. Uh, the Smith chart is a mapping from the complex plane into the complex plane. So both the domain and the range space are the complex plane. Uh, it's a bilinear mapping, which means that circles 
in the domain space map into circles or lines in the range space. And similarly, lines in the domain space map into circles or lines in the range space. So we could say lines or circles map into lines or circles. Um, it's also conformal. It's a conformal mapping, which means that angles are preserved. So for example, at the bottom left, you see a circle and a line intersecting with two intersection points and eight right angles. And the image of that circle and that line in the range space is shown on the right, where we have a circle intersecting another circle and all eight angles are right angles. Uh, the conformal property means angles are preserved. And in particular, right angles are preserved. The coordinate grid on the Smith chart, since the Smith chart is designed so that the Smith chart is actually in the reflection coefficient plane, so the vertical and horizontal axes, we will terminate that. The, um, the domain space is the right half of the complex impedance plane. Uh, the grid axis are vertical lines of constant resistance and horizontal lines of constant reactance. Those being lines map into circles in the domain space, which is the complex reflection coefficient space and the interior of the unit disk, according to the transformation equations. And the next slide will show what they look like. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with the constant resistance circles and the constant reactance arcs on the Smith chart. I'll point out that the zero impedance point is the point on the far left, and the infinite impedance point is point on the far right. So this configuration is rotated from Philip Smith's original uh, configuration. Um, you can rotate the coordinates by 180 degrees. We're not rotating the chart, we're rotating the coordinates, and we get the admittance coordinates. Um, and there we have constant conductance circles and constant susceptance arcs. And now the uh, infinite admittance point is on the left and the ad infinite admittance, zero admittance point is far on the right. The Smith chart used to be used for doing calculations. Nowadays it's used mainly for display of data because it allows you to see things that you cannot see if you simply look at rectangular Cartesian plots of things like return loss. I'm going to highlight the uh, conductance circles and the resistance circles later, but here they are separately. So you'll see the constant conductance circles are as shown on the left. The constant resistance circles are as shown on the right. And these in some uh, charts will be overlaid. You'll see both sets visible simultaneously. A lot of EDA programs let you turn the grids on and off at will. So you can either look at the admittance coordinates or the impedance coordinates or both at the same time. Here are some circles that are not as well, not known as well as they should be. Uh, the constant emittance magnitude arcs. That means the magnitude of impedance or the magnitude of admittance is constant on these arcs. And they are circles, they terminate on the boundary circle in right angles. Um, and so the vertical line in the center is the, we call it the 50 ohm or unit unit uh, normalized impedance line. So if I tell you that the impedance is, is unity normalized, all I'm telling you is that uh, the impedance is somewhere on that vertical line. Uh, the point in the middle is unity real, one plus J zero. The point at the top of that line is uh, zero plus J one. And the point at the bottom of that line is zero minus J one. Perpendicular or orthogonal set of circles to these are the constant impedance phase angle circles, sometimes called the Q arcs, and they all pass through uh, the zero impedance point and the infinite impedance point. So you can construct them uh, with compass and ruler. Um, and they are form an orthogonal set of circles to the uh, emittance magnitude uh, arcs or circles. Now, uh, let's back up just one. And uh, let me say one more thing. 
uh, if you follow the upper semicircle on the boundary uh, from the left to the right, it starts off at zero. Uh, the numbers, if you read off on the reactance arcs as they terminate, and I don't know if my pointer will show, I'm pointing at the 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, all the way up to unity, and then two, four, five, 10, and infinity. So that's a, a real number line for the positive real numbers that goes from zero to infinity. Uh, I'll call it a number line, it's really a, call it a number arc. But there's another one that cuts horizontally through the center that also starts at zero. And the numbers where the resistance circles cross march up until you hit one, and then you have two, three, four, five, 10, 20, and infinity. So there's a number, another real number line for positive real numbers. And then of course, along the bottom, we have the same thing. So we have three real number lines that are actually useful on that chart. And we can use those number lines to do things like multiply two numbers. So if I want to multiply A times B, I'll put A on the upper uh, number line, B on the lower number line, and I'll read off the product on the middle number line, the horizontal line. So A times B appears in here, I'm multiplying 0.5 times uh, four, and my answer is two. Now you can also do, let me go back. You can do division. You put your divisor on say the bottom number line, you put your dividend on the middle number line and you read your quotient off the upper number line. So you can do multiplication and division. Now, because you can do multiplication and division, you can do square roots and squares. The way you square a number is you put the number on the upper or lower number line and you drop a perpendicular and read off the square on the horizontal number line. The, the way that you do a square root is you enter on the horizontal number line and you erect a vertical to the boundary and you read off the square root on the upper or the lower number line. Tangents and cotangents are easily done. In fact, RF engineers know this from their uh, transmission line stub calculations. Uh, the way you compute the impedance of a short-circuited stub is you, if it's short-circuited, you start at zero, way on the left, you revolve clockwise through an angle a physical angle of two theta, electrical angle of theta, and you read off the tangent of theta on the perimeter. X, the reactance is equal to the tangent of theta. For a uh, open circuited stub, you would start normally at infinity and revolve clockwise along the chart through a physical angle of two theta, and then read off the uh, negative J cotangent of theta. Uh, you can drop the minus sign and do it just on the upper arc like I've done, do it in reverse, go counterclockwise and the answer will come out. Uh, you're taking care of the minus sign and you read off the cotangent of theta, or in this case, I'm using the letter phi. A co cotangent of phi, where if two phi is the physical angle, then the number on the perimeter there will be the cotangent of phi. So it's tangents and cotangents. A more complicated one Philip Smith did not know about is sines and cosines. And this is very obscure, but if you want to take the sine and the cosine of theta, what you do is you erect a line from the center of the chart to the boundary at a physical angle of theta. Then you erect, erect another line from zero to the point on the boundary and you see where it crosses the vertical axis. Where it crosses the vertical axis, the real part will be cosine theta and the imaginary part will be sine theta. So you can do sines and cosines. So you can use your Smith chart as an analog computer much like you would use a slide rule. And in fact, you can get about three significant figures off the chart. You have to keep the, uh, just like a slide rule, you keep the mantissa in your head, scaling it to the range between 0.3 and three, and you carry the exponent in your head. And you can get about three significant figures for these kinds of calculations. So all you need really is a Smith chart, uh, maybe a protractor or a straight edge and a compass, and you can do all kinds of calculations uh, similar to what you could do with a slide rule. 
Uh, logarithms are more complicated. You actually need the, the return loss scale that's printed beside the Smith chart, but I'm not gonna go into that. Let's shift to network theory. I wanna say a few words about classical network theory. Basically the histories of it, the subject started uh, early in electrical engineering, uh, maybe the prehistory of electrical engineering. Uh, let's start with 1893 when the word impedance was invented. And that was by Arthur Edwin Kennelly, who was a physicist, a British physicist. Uh, following that in about, for about 10 years, Charles Proteus Steinmetz, who was a German physicist that who was hired by Thomas Edison to work at the General Electric, Thomas Edison General Electric Company, uh, brought AC circuit theory into prominence and taught uh, electrical engineers to do AC circuit calculations using complex numbers. Uh, the word phasers actually came later, but nowadays we would call them phasers for doing steady state sinusoidal analysis of AC circuits. So AC circuit theory was developed in that decade and popularized. Steinmetz also developed or invented the word reactants. So the first occurrence of the word reactants came from Steinmetz. Uh, that was followed by uh, an important in innovation called the reactance theorems of Otto Zobel and Ronald Martin Foster uh, in, eight, in 1923 and 1924. And that is actually the starting point, uh, official starting point of classical network theory. Prior to that, electrical engineers were working on filters and AC theory uh, the filter theory got more increasingly abstract and developed into the subject of network theory, which has to do with uh, topological connections of elements and what sorts of functions can be realized, what sort of impedance functions and tra transfer functions can be realized. Um, the first synthesis procedure was Foster's uh, method for lossless networks. He could synthesize lossless networks using partial fractions. And that, in short order, was done in Germany by uh, Wilhelm Kauer, who showed you could use continued fractions to get ladder networks. So the lossless network synthesis problem was solved very early. That was followed by the uh, more general problem of lossy networks. When you have networks that have loss, how do you synthesize networks those kind of networks, that work was done by Otto Brun. Uh, I believe it was at MIT. Um, in fact, I'm certain it was at MIT. Uh, the Brun procedure became actually the key procedure uh, of, the, of, the, of that era. That was followed by Darlington's work at Bell Labs. Darlington showed that you, can, you could do the same thing with networks, any, any realizable network Function, impedance function could be realized with a network having no more than one resistor. So you don't need a bunch of resistors. One resistor is sufficient. You do need a bunch of capacitors and inductors and mutual inductors and transformers, but only one resistor is sufficient to realize any passive impedance function. Um, then of course we got, we, that was generalized to multiport networks. And then eventually it was shown that mutual inductance and transformers are unnecessary. Okay, I have 10 minutes and then we're gonna take a break. Um, the book by Gilliman. Gilliman was a professor at MIT. His book came out in 1957. It was, he was put it off for many years. He'd been teaching for probably at least 20, almost 30 years by that point. And uh, it was only his student, David Tuttle was going to publish a big magnum opus on network synthesis, which he did in 58. Uh, that prompted Gilliman to uh, hurry up and finish his book and get it in print first. Uh, Tuttle's book was massive. And it surprisingly is called part one, <laughs> but part two was never published. Uh, and that stands today as probably the biggest book on network synthesis. Uh, in the late, actually in the early fifties, interest be shifted from passive synthesis to active synthesis, active networks. And the subject was revived and went on for about another 10 years and up until the mid to late sixties. And then it died out as all the universities dropped these courses and shifted into more general courses on linear system theory and later state space 
system theory and the concepts of realizability and synthesis were uh, became relics of history. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the subject has not died. There's still work being done in various universities, very small amount of work being done. And even uh, in 2009, another deep result was found. The last of all the singular elements was discovered in, um, I believe it was in Spain. Um, and then non-foster networks came along uh, in the early 2000s and uh, a lot of work was done on non-foster networks, which revived the subject yet again and gave an interesting extension tying in new results on both passive and active network theory. Let's see if we can change slides. There we go. Here are a picture of some of the key network theorists are, at, are on the top and some of the key uh, uh, people that did, did ancillary work or educators who taught work and promulgated the topic are on the bottom. Um, I won't go through all of these people. Uh, the top right is Dante Eula. We lost him last year. He was the last of the great classical network theorists. Um, poles and zeros, everybody in this audience knows about. I don't need to explain poles and zeros. Frequency is complex frequency. It has a real part an imaginary part. We usually write the complex frequency with the letter S. The real part is the letter sigma and the imaginary part is omega. And what is confusing to some is that in many books, uh, omega is called real frequency. So the real frequency is the actually the imaginary part of complex frequency. Uh, once you understand that convention, it, everything becomes clear uh, and you're no longer confused. There's one other convention that's confusing is that some books use e to the plus j omega t or e to the and e to the minus j omega t in their definition of transforms and therefore sometimes the time axis gets flipped and that leads to flips in the signs of reactances and that can be very confusing as it was in a paper I just read today by Yajian uh, in the transactions on antennas and propagation where he uses the reverse sign convention and flips his time axis. Um, now that was a very good paper, by the way, I'll recommend it. Um, here are the properties of impedance functions. If they're passive, if an impedance function is passive, that is if it obeys conservation of energy and time causality represents a device that obeys time causality, then it's what is called a positive real function. And positive real functions are analytic in the right half of the complex frequency plane. In the right half of the S plane, the impedance function Z of S is analytic. Poles and zeros, if they exist, are only on the J omega axis or in the left half of the impedance plane. Uh, if the emittance function represents a lumped constant RLC network, uh, then in then the form of the emittance function is um, a rational function and the numerator polynomial and the denominator polynomial have the property that uh, none of the middle coefficients are missing. So B cannot be zero, C cannot be zero, uh, E cannot be zero. Well, e, e isn't zero, but all the coefficients are positive in both polynomials, or they could all be negative, it doesn't matter, but they're all positive by convention. Uh, middle coefficients are present, not missing. And the last important fact is that the degree of the numerator and the degree of the denominator, if we look at the leading terms, those degrees differ by at most one. The numerator could be a uh, could be one degree, a degree one higher or a degree one lower, or it could be the same degree as the denominator polynomial. And similarly for the last coefficient, it can be, you'll notice that the G term is missing, which means that the denominator, the, uh, the low order denominator term is S and the, in the numerator it's, it's, it's uh, S to the zero. Those degrees differ by at most one. This can be summarized by saying that an impedance function, if it represents a passive device, it cannot increase faster than f to the first power of frequency, and it cannot decrease faster than one over f. For lossless elements, 
that don't have any losses, uh, the slopes of the reactants functions, reactants versus frequency and uh, susceptance versus frequency are strictly positive. Uh, Foster's key results were to show that those poles and zeros of reactants functions exist only on the real frequency axis. The poles and the zeros are simple. The poles and zeros have positive real residues and the poles alternate with the zeros. And because of those, because of that fact, there necessarily is a pole or a zero, both at, at zero frequency and at infinity. That was the key result. And that is what actually launched the network synthesis, uh, network analysis community, the whole field. An important result for us today is that the real part and the imaginary part of a passive emittance function cannot be specified independently. One determines the other, in fact. So if I tell you that I have a device or a network port, and I give you the real impedance as a function of real frequency, I have given you actually the means to calculate the reactance as a function of frequency to a certain, up to a certain point. And likewise, if I give you the reactance as a function of frequency, that determines the resistance as a function of frequency up to a certain point. And that point is, well, well before I give you the formulas, uh, let me explain what that means. You suspect this result, but you don't really believe it until you see it. Um, I give you an impedance that has coefficients A, B, C, D in the numerator and e, e in the denominator. The numerator coefficients and the denominator coefficients also determine the real part and the imaginary part of that impedance so that the, the resistance function depends on the same coefficients that the imaginary part or the reactance part depends on. So that suggests that there is a connection that you can't arbitrarily uh, write any old reactance function once you've specified the, the resistance function. The actual connection is given by the poisson schwartz integrals, sometimes called the Kramers-Kronig relations, that shows you that the real part of an impedance is determined by the reactance to within uh, an additive constant, a positive constant R naught. And likewise, the reactance function is determined by the resistance function to within an additive analytic function. So consequently, you can show that certain kinds of devices like the square law resistor cannot physically exist. You can, you, there's no such thing as a passive square law resistor. It's a physical impossibility. Um, you have to give up passivity to have such a device. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is Tom McKay. Uh, yes. And uh, we're under one minute. I just want to, I think it's probably good to keep your slide at this setting. And then unfortunately, folks, uh, I'm going to have to ask you to rejoin the meeting. It's going to end in less than a minute. And then um, I will restart the meeting. So I'll, uh, then you all can rejoin. I, I sincerely apologize for this uh, uh, odd situation. That, uh, uh, we ran into t Okay, uh, so sh shall we continue? Yeah, I guess, Doctor, we should go ahead and continue. There are more folks who are joining. Um, and one, one, one uh, thought uh, is um, for Q&A, it, it, sometimes we, we like to offer, you know, Q&A in, 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 in the middle of the talk in case folks have some questions. But I, I guess at this point, I would, I would argue that it probably is better to go ahead and uh, we'll try to hold the questions uh, for the end. I don't know how you feel about it, but um, yeah. With the I'll, I'll suggest if there's questions, people just jot them into the chat and then we'll, at the end, we'll, we'll go to the chat list if it's preserved. But if, if the chat list gets dropped every time this meeting drops, then- what, what, what we found, uh, uh, Doctor, is uh, Folks can use the reaction button to raise their hand when the Q&A period starts, and then we unmute them, and then they'll go ahead and ask their question verbally. That, that's been working for us. That works fine for me. Okay. okay. So, but I leave it to you if you want to do a little offer a question and answer right now. Uh, it wouldn't be a bad time. There might be some more folks rejoining. I'm not sure. Uh, it seems to be saturating about 60 attendees. Um, so it's up to you. Okay. Let's let's 
punch through this session on network uh, synthesis theory, okay. and then we'll we'll take some questions because that'll be a, the natural transition. Very good. Um, so Darlington synthesis, I, I mentioned you can synthesize a, a passive network function or an impedance function with at most one resistor. Normally we'll take that resistor and pull it outside of the uh, schematic and call it a port. And so you can think of a network then as being, as containing a, a two port that contains only reactances or transformers, mutual inductance, LCs and, in, and inductances, but no resistance. And then the one resistor becomes the port and then you have an input port. And so uh, something like an antenna that has a radiation resistance and a lossless resistance can be represented uh, in what's called a Darlington form using Darlington synthesis. And that's shown in the center. What's commonly done by some authors is they think they can just stick uh, a reactance in series with a resistance and call it a equivalent circuit or a susceptance in parallel with a conductance and call that a equivalent circuit. Well, it, it may be an equivalent circuit or not depending on the nature of the reactance and the susceptance, but it certainly won't, doesn't have the generality that it can follow an antenna and we'll see why in a moment um, in the next session, in fact. Uh, but antennas can be represented as two ports. An antenna emulator can be represented as a two port uh, where you have one port represents the feed point and the other represents a resistor. Uh, Darlington also showed, of course, since he allowed ideal transformers, that resistor can have any value you want. Conventionally, it's just taken to be a one ohm resistor, but you can make it a 377 ohm resistor and call it free space. Uh, and in that case, you regard the reactance two port as a transformation from the feed point impedance to free space TEM impedance. Um, so that's a little bit on Darlington forms, and they're very important in our, in our uh, understanding of how to represent uh, impedances. And so this is a good point for a question or two. If there's a question, uh, somebody can raise their hand and ask. Yeah, uh, folks, um, if you go to the lower part of the screen, you can see reactions, and there's a button there that says raise hand. Uh, I'm doing it now myself. Um, I'll lower my hand. But if, uh, if there's anybody that would like to ask a question to Dr. Stearns right now, please uh, click on the raise your hand button. Okay, we have um, Ken Manders. Uh, are you able to unmute? Hey, good evening. I was curious, uh, have you ever messed around with telephone transmission lines. Yes. There they have a distributed R. And so, you know, what, I've never been able to make one of those things work on a Smith chart um, because of that fact. Well, um, telephone, yeah, okay. Telephone transmission lines don't work nicely on a Smith chart for another reason, which is that their characteristic impedance is usually a complex number, not a real number. So to use a Smith chart, you need to have a transmission line that has a real characteristic impedance so that you can normalize. Uh, you can't normalize by a complex number. Uh, well, you can do it, but it's, it's, it's more intricate. Uh, so, I, so that's pretty much the problem. Yeah, the distributed R is, is, is common to any transmission line is you have a distributed R ohms per Okay, thank you for your response. I appreciate it. I often fantasized about there must be a Smith chart for dealing with these transmission lines. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's, yeah, there's a way. Yeah, there's a way to actually extend the use of the Smith chart to allow for complex impedance normalization. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. That's a separate and fairly lengthy tutorial. <laughs> so, uh, okay, carry on, Steve. Thank okay, you. Okay, very good. I, okay, I see, you know, I see no other hands up, Doctor. So we can go ahead and move on. Good. So antenna impedance functions. I'm just gonna show a few for different antennas to give you an idea of some common features about an all antenna impedance functions. Uh, let's consider a dipole in free space. Uh, we have our AC source. I make the joke that AC stands for a cat. So you see a little cat in the 
source generator. Uh, that's an allusion back to Einstein's explanation of radio. When Einstein was asked, how does radio work? He said, well, radio works. He said, you know how a telephone works. A telephone is like a very long cat. You pull his tail in New York and his head meows in Los Angeles. And radio works the same way, except there is no cat. And now we believe that Einstein was wrong on that point, that actually radio is entirely controlled by cats. Uh, that is according to the English poet T.S. Eliot uh, and also the musical Cats by Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, and I won't pursue that any farther except to say that there's uh, some very amusing uh, things in, in, in T.S. Eliot's work. Um, so we have a dipole, it's symmetric, it's center fed. Uh, its impedance is a complex function of frequency. It has a real part. It has a, a reactance or an imaginary part. The first resonance occurs when the length is just under a half wavelength. We write it this way as, as uh, length of resonance is K times lambda over two. You take a wavelength in free space, divide by two, and then multiply it by a constant K, which is a number between zero and one, typically around 0.9. Or, or thereabouts, and that will give you the length at which the dipole will be resonant. What is resonance? Resonance is a frequency at which the uh, impedance uh, is purely real. The reactance goes to zero. Um, and again, when we use frequency in that sentence, I'm referring to real frequency or omega or F, not complex frequency. So here's an example. This is a a thin wire dipole about 100 feet long, uh, number 10 wire plotted from one megahertz to 30 megahertz. Uh, lossless antennas or low loss antennas um, always will start their impedance curve at zero frequency or DC. They'll always start at either the extreme left-hand point of the Smith chart, which is the zero impedance point, or they'll start at the extreme right-hand point of the Smith chart, which is the infinite impedance point. In other words, these antennas act like either a short circuit or an open circuit at DC. And then as you increase frequency, they revolve clockwise, they spiral clockwise. The curve is always bending to the right as frequency increases and they'll spiral around. And every time you cross the horizontal axis in the upward direction, those are resonances. And every time you cross the horizontal axis in the downward directions, those are called anti-resonances. Here's another antenna. This one is a GPS antenna. This curve is from about 1.2 gigahertz to about 1.6. And you can see it, there's a downward crossing. So that's a anti-resonance. And then it spirals around. And there's another downward crossing. But between those two, there's an upward crossing, that's a resonance, and then an anti-resonance, and then another resonance. So you've got two resonances and two anti-resonances on this particular seg segment of this curve. Um, we don't know what it is at DC, but at DC, it's certain that it's gonna either go to the left point or the right point of the Smith chart, depending on whether the feed point looks like an open circuit or a short circuit. Here we have another antenna, this is a monopole, this is an active monopole made by Rodian and Schwartz. Uh, so, so there's a preamp in the base. If we just look at the rod part of this monopole, it's a rod over a ground plane. And it will, again, behave very much like the dipole, except the resonant impedance now is, the, at resonance, the real part of the impedance is 37 ohms. Um, but it, it spirals around, it's got a resonance, an anti-resonance, a resonance, an anti-resonance, a resonance, and another anti-resonance. And this is all between um, one megahertz and 500 megahertz. I can't show you any American spy planes, they'd probably arrest me. So I'll, since the Russians have copied our designs very effectively, uh, I'll get around that restriction by just showing you a Russian spy plane. It looks exactly the same as some of ours. A uh, bent blade antenna is on, shown on the top and the bottom of this spy plane. And um, let's look at the bent blade. Uh, it behaves very like, much like a bent uh, monopole or an L. 
um, starts off at uh, infinite impedance, looks like an open circuit at DC, and as you increase frequency from 100 megahertz to 500 megahertz, it spirals around, it has a resonance, and one anti-resonance, and then that's it. Nothing, no more resonance is after beyond that point. But it does spiral to the right, uh, or clockwise, as you expect. If you plot in Cartesian coordinates, you'll see the resonance and the anti-resonance are where the reactance curve crosses zero. Here's a disc cone. This is from an article I did about 15 years ago in a ham magazine called QEX. Uh, and the disc cone uh, behaves like a, pretty much like a monopole over a small ground screen. Uh, and it, it, this, this particular antenna has a resonance doesn't have any anti-resonances, at least not in the frequency band plotted. And I plotted it from 100 megahertz to one gigahertz. Uh, here's a broadband dipole from an old book on impedance matching. And uh, the data was drawn uh, in originally with a French curve. And I just put it in an S1P file and replotted it in a modern EDA type program for circuit analysis and use a uh, cubic spline interpolator. And uh, that's the blue curve. And you can see it agrees pretty well with the original curve with, that is in black. So the French curve technique was pretty accurate, might even be more accurate. Uh, I see a hand raised. Let's hold questions. You can raise your hand, but let's hold questions until the end of this se section. So the summary of all of these examples is that impedance curves always bend or spiral clockwise as frequency increases. Um, this property, some people have argued that it's due to Foster's reactance theorem. It actually has nothing to do with Foster's reactance theorem. It's a property of all positive real impedance functions, which means that any passive device, the impedance function will always spiral clockwise on the Smith chart and it can spiral all over the place. It doesn't have to cross the horizontal axis, but it may. Um, so an antenna can have no resonances. It can lie entirely, the curve can lie entirely in the top half or the bottom half of the Smith chart, or an antenna can have a finite number of resonances. I showed some of those, or an antenna can have an infinite number of resonances. And the thin wire dipole, uh, also, the, if you plot theoretical equations like the induced EMF method, uh, you'll get an infinite number of resonances. Uh, so that pretty much summarizes the section. Now, if someone wanted to raise their hand, this would be a good time to do it. Can I talk? Can you guys yes. hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Appreciating your talk. Um, the, so I'm thinking about the design consideration so let's say whatever you're a ham operator, and uh, I assume you you know you might have a particular frequency, so you'd want to design your antenna so that what it would be on the horizontal axis, so that it's a resonance, or you know, could you talk about the de the design considerations uh, of antenna in the context of the Smith chart? Smith chart. Yes. Okay. Uh, traditionally, and all the early works on antennas including the professional literature, focused entirely on impedance properties of antennas. And the idea in the ham literature was that an antenna should be resonant. Uh, but we see that resonance simply implies that the impedance curve crosses the horizontal line somewhere on that Smith chart. And that's not really what you want. You want it to cross near the center. And moreover, you don't even care if the impedance is on the horizontal line. You just want it to be near the center because that's what defines a match. A match is, is the, the impedance crosses through the center of the Smith chart. It doesn't matter if it passes slightly above the, the center or below the center or to the left or to the right. So the impedance doesn't have to be on the horizontal axis at all. You don't, an antenna doesn't need to be resonant to have a good match. Um, with respect to the design of antennas, what we really want is maximum uh, realized gain. So that's taking into account the, the gain of the antenna uh, multiplied by um, uh, 
or subtracted subtracting off the mismatch loss. So the antenna as matched uh, should have an S21 and that's what you want to maximize. Um, nowadays, we, we try to design the antennas for pattern performance, not for impedance. And that's because impedance matching is pretty much a solved problem. Uh, and if you don't know how to do it, you just buy some software like the Opteni software. The Opteni software is pretty good. Um, I don't want to make endorsements, but um, you, you, you can buy books for hundreds of dollars. It'll tell you how to do what's in that software <laughs> and then write your own code. Um, so we design antennas for maximum gain in a particular direction or in all directions at once. If we're doing broadcasting, we want to maximize the gain wherever the audience is, as tends to make the antenna omnidirectional. So we're simply trying to control the elevation pattern. If we're doing DX, uh, long distance communication or point to point communication, we wanna maximize the gain in a particular direction. If we're doing ionospheric communication, we wanna maximize the gain for a particular elevation angle, usually a low angle between five and 20 degrees, because we're trying to get the, uh, the maximum gain from a certain number of hops off the ionosphere. Um, if we're doing close in communication, we wanna maximize the gain straight up. Uh, so that we can talk to folks who are you know, within 500 miles of where we are, talk over the hill or talk, talk to folks uh, in the next state over. Um, so it's all about pattern optimization and, and maximizing realized gain. If you're doing only receiving antennas, then you have more freedom because you don't have to worry about impedance matching into the antenna. You can simply put a, a high gain preamplifier uh, that loads the antenna with either a very high impedance or a very low impedance and use the antenna as a probe. Uh, so that's common. They're called, those are called active antennas. Um, okay, let me jump ahead now to, in, to the difference between a model and an equivalent circuit. Thanks. Uh, oh, question, is there another? Uh, yes, sir, I have a question. Sir, uh, what is uh, anti-resonance uh, means, uh, what is the physical significance of that? Is that, uh, is this the particular property takes part in antenna radiation? No, anti-resonance. So resonance and anti-resonance. Anti-resonance, we could just say that all the, all the crossings of the horizontal axis are resonances, but it's traditional to call the upward crossings resonances and the lower downward crossings anti-resonances. There's no physical significance. It's just that the impedance curve is spiraling around. And if it happens to cross the horizontal axis going up, it's called a resonance. And if it happens to cross the horizontal axis going down, uh, which implies the direction with respect to frequency, or actually makes a statement about the derivative of the reactants. Uh, with respect to frequency. If, so a downward crossing is called a, downward crossings are sometimes called resonances, but more commonly they're called anti-resonances. No, Other than that, there, there's no statement about radiation in that, no, no implication about radiation. Uh, Jay Banway, you have raised your hand, go ahead. Yeah, hi Stephen. Uh, could you comment um, about uh, radiation efficiency? Yes, uh, radiation ref efficiency refers to the loss, losses in the antenna. Um, an antenna can have losses. And by the way, most of these comments are also can be generalized to all microwave devices. So they're not unique to, to antennas. Losses can take many forms. Some, in some devices, radiation is a loss. So for example, if I had a circulator, I could lose power due to radiation, <laughs> so radiation would be a loss. In the case of antennas, the radiation is the part I want. So what we'll do is we'll compare this amount of, of power that goes into radiation and reaches the far field to the amount of power that doesn't reach the far field because it's dissipated locally. Now the local dissipation mechanisms are usually ohmic losses in the, in the wire or the metal, uh, dielectric losses from anything that's nearby that's dielectric that absorbs power, uh, earth losses, it, since you're radiating in, you're not in outer space if you're on planet Earth, then you've got the ground absorbing, absorbing some radiation as the wave travels. So all of those losses combined means that the power that you, that you put into the antenna does not all reach the far field. 
Um, some of it is lost in the, in the matching or the mismatching process. Others are lost in these dissipation processes. And so we can express the ratio of the total power that's, that's uh, uh, being delivered to the antenna, uh, the ratio of that to, to the power that is radiated actually reaches the far field. Uh, that's the radiation efficiency. Uh, we have this fictional concept of a radiation resistance and we can, uh, con we can consider that there's a, a loss resistance composed of all of these different loss mechanisms that's in series with this fictional radiation resistance and, and look at the, look at the uh, rate, rate antenna efficiency as a ratio of these resistances. Uh, but the resistances are not actual physical resistances at the feed point. Those are they're simply equivalent resistances that account for the power loss that's happening somewhere, often in different places. Sometimes in the in the in the plastic on the insulation of the wire. In the in the uh, if there's transmission line, then it's in the uh, uh, the dielectric uh, material in the in the insulation of the transmission line. Uh, it could be in the earth. Um, uh, or, or just the ohmic loss in the, in the metals themselves. So that's a, a real quick synopsis of the concept of efficiency. Um, Thank you. Uh, I was, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, we probably have about 20 minutes left in this session. Uh, do you think we'll need another session or should we try to... I think it? we're, we're going to need another session because... Uh, okay. We're, so we're, uh, let's just announce then for all attendees, uh, look like most, uh, not quite all from the first session, we're able to, they did. Hey Tom, it. your voice is quite low. I don't know if, if I'm the only one. Hello? Yeah. yeah, your voice is, your. Um, Can you hear me now? Oh, this is a bit better. Okay. Um, so I'm just uh, announcing that uh, we're, we're kind of done with questions for this this section. I think we need to kind of move on, but uh, uh, well, um, we're realizing that we'll probably need another Zoom session. Um, and so folks, uh, please uh, accept my apologies for the requirement to rejoin the meeting. I'll restart the meeting as, uh, as we did last time. And, and thank you all for uh, accommodating that. Uh, I don't know, Steve, do you wanna take one more question before you move on or we have- um, or Yeah. Please? How many minutes do we have? We have time for a question, I think. So is there a question? Anuj? Anuj Modi, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so like uh, someone asked a question about uh, resonance and anti-resonance. And uh, at that time, I just something came to my mind. So. Uh, so my question is like, uh, uh, does it matter like in terms of uh, like uh, matching bandwidth, whether we basically try to match for uh, resonance or anti-resonance, something like that? Uh, is there something like uh, in inherently some kind of relation that if we try to match uh, anti-resonance, uh, it would be narrow band or broadband compared to resonance, something like that? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say that the, that there is a bound on impedance match bandwidth. It's the Fano bound. Um, and there's also a second bound called the Carlin La Rosa bound that's not as well known. The Fano bound uh, applies to uh, lossless match networks. So if, if you're gonna match the antenna with a lossless network, there's a limit to how much bandwidth you can get and it's related to um, properties of the impedance of the antenna. It's basically related ultimately to how tightly the antenna spirals around on the Smith chart. The, the uh, topic of the Fano bandwidth is, is a separate uh, complete talk in itself. And uh, so how do you do broadband matching is, is a subject I, I probably should defer that, not cover it tonight. I'm trying to tonight to just talk about antenna impedance. Uh, the next step after, the next logical topic after that would be matching. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll forego that. Um, but there is a natural bandwidth that the antenna can, can have set by the chew bound, which is a physical bound based on the size of the antenna. And then in addition for matching, there's the Fano bound. So those are the key, the key bounds. And people have been trying various techniques for years. I even 
uh, developed a whole theory of how to get around the FANO bound by using non-fostered networks rather than regular networks, uh, show how you could expand the impedance bandwidth of an antenna or match, you can match an antenna over a broader band. So- but Can we make some kind of like a comment about like, if we try to match for resonance compared to anti-resonance, something like comparison make, of those? It makes no difference. It makes no, no difference. difference. Okay. Re okay. Resonance has no, has no bearing on the matter. Uh, what does have a bearing on the matter is the derivative of the reactance function. Okay. So we, so we have 10 minutes left. Uh, so let's get through at least another section. We'll talk about the difference between a model and an equivalent circuit. And the first thing I'll say is that an equivalent circuit is a type of model, but a model is, an impedance model is a more general animal. Uh, an impedance model simply is a way, it's a, it's a mathematical formula typically that tells you what the impedance of the antenna is. A mathematical formula can involve special functions. I've shown here uh, the induced EMF equations for the uh, impedance of a dipole antenna, a dipole or a monopole over infinite ground screen. Uh, it involves sines and cosines and sine integrals and cosine integrals. Uh, a logarithm, uh, Euler's constant, a bunch of stuff, but it's a formula. So a model is an algorithm for calculating impedance. Uh, it doesn't have to be something that is physical. Uh, generally, it involves any kind of mathematical function, which could be a polynomial, a rational function, uh, special functions, or ad hoc formulas. But ultimately, it's a compressed representation of, of the impedance. It could even be a table of numbers, like an S1P file. Um, and then, you, of course, you can interpolate on the table with a, with a spline interpolator to get impedances at frequencies between the data points. Um, so it's good for computation, interpolation, SWR prediction, but it's not good for physical testing, because how do you test your antenna by uh, uh, using a formula? Um, that's not a physical test. An equivalent circuit, on the other hand, is a special kind of a model. It's an actual electric circuit, and it's physically realizable, and it's made of passive elements because antennas are passive devices. Uh, so we'll make the equivalent circuit of resistors, inductors, and capacitors. And these are the in resistors, inductors, and capacitors of circuit theory. So these are ideal lumped constant elements. Uh, we can include mutual inductance and transformers. An impedance is specified by a positive real rational function. Well, if you connect these devices I've named, these passive elements together, you will get a positive real rational function automatically. That's the only kind of function you can get. Um, so the circuit approximates the uh, impedance behavior to any specified accuracy over any specified bandwidth. And that's our goal. Uh, not just a narrow band approximation, but a broadband approximation. And we'll, this talk will show how to do that. Um, but you can also use the circuit to build uh, dummies. You can actually build the circuit, make uh, emulators for either one port emulators for reflection measurements, or you can make two port emulators for transmission measurements and tests. So for example, if you wanted to measure error vector magnitude, EVM of a digital signal sent through an antenna, and received by another antenna, you could put two of these antenna emulators back to back and, and feed point of one, you put your generator and at the feed point of the other one, you put your receiving uh, test equipment. So you can actually do physical measurement. We have enough time to get through the next topic, low order equivalent circuits. Low order equivalent circuits are typically uh, equivalent circuits that are made very simple with just a few lumped elements a series RLC, a parallel RLC, those are the two at the top. Those are the two most common. Those circuits turn out not to be very broadband. Uh, they, they'll only approximate the antenna over, over a narrow bandwidth. And that narrow bandwidth might be 5% uh, five, 5 bandwidth, might be typical. 5% bandwidth using those. You can approximate the antenna over a wider bandwidth if you use one of the two equivalent circuits in the middle, the, two, the TM1 mode uh, three element circuit or the two TE one 
mode equivalent circuit. That's just a rearrangement of the of the elements. You've still got three, but they they're connected differently, and that gives you uh, a broader bandwidth approximation. Uh, works pretty well for electrically small antennas. So those may give you 10% bandwidth, and beyond 10% bandwidth, they 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 are no longer accurate. You go a little wider if you want to add one extra element to get to a four element. Uh, the two on the bottom are, are two that I use, have used, uh, developed to model antennas over wider bandwidths. And you, you, we might get 15 or 20% bandwidth out of those models. Again, it's not a broadband model. It's not a model you would use for a broadband antenna, but it is a model that will work for narrow band communication applications. Um, but the two at the top are the common ones. Uh, the three on the, in the column on the left are for antennas that are near resonance, and the three in the column on the right are for circuits that are near anti-resonance. And the circuits on the left and the circuits on the right are related because they're duals, they're electrical duals. Now, I haven't talked about duals. Uh, if you're into circuit theory, then you know what duals are. Um, but uh, uh, Maxwell's equations allow us to have what are called complementary antennas uh, in which the E and the H fields are interchanged. Um, circuit theory allows us to have dual circuits in which voltage and current are interchanged. Uh, and, and impedance becomes admittance, admittance becomes impedance. And there's uh, simple topological rules for redrawing a schematic to construct the dual of a schematic from the original schematic. Uh, Every schematic that can be drawn in a plane that is without lines crossing in a plane uh, has a dual, a topological dual. Uh, circuits that are not, cannot be drawn in a plane uh, may or may not have a topological dual, uh, but the ones that are planar always have a topological dual. That's guaranteed by, again, by network theory. Um, so let's look at some of these. Um, as an antenna impedance curve spirals on the smooth chart, and we've seen those spirals, uh, it can become tangent to the constant conductance circles or the constant resistance circles. And by tangent, I mean not just uh, touching the circle, but aligning with the circle and having the same direction so that it curves in the same direction that the circle curves. So these tangencies, you could call them generalized tangencies, uh, they correspond to three element uh, RLC circuits. If you have a impedance curve that's tangent to a resistance circle, uh, then DRDF is zero and you have a series RLC circuit. If you have a impedance curve that's tangent to a conductance circle, then DGDF, the conductance derivative is zero, and you have a parallel resonance circuit, parallel RLC. So that gives us the justification for the two circuits that were at the top of the preceding uh, diagram or chart. Now an antenna can have many of these tangencies, or it may have none <laughs> as it spirals around on the Smith chart. So uh, you can have many narrowband RLC equivalent circuits all at different frequencies, one for each tangency. Um, the R circle tangencies and the G circle tangencies sometimes alternate, but they don't have to. Sometimes you can have two Rs in a row and, and no Gs. Uh, so here's an example. This is our GPS antenna. We have about a minute and a half left, so I'll get through this example, I think. Uh, you can see, as I said before, we have an anti-resonance, then a resonance, then an anti-resonance, then a resonance. Um, here it is in Cartesian coordinates. The green dots are the anti-resonances, and you can construct parallel RLC circuits at those points, and um, those are uh, and the, the numbers. It says the conductance circle. The value is is uh, 1.5 milli siemens and 6.145 milli siemens circle. Those are the two circles, the conductance circles, and the two blue dots represent the resistance circles that the curve is tangent to. And there you have uh, uh, the eight ohm resistance circle near 1400 megahertz and the 33 ohm circle near about uh, 17, 17 or 18 uh, 
um, 1.7 or 1.8 gigahertz. And here you can see it back over here. I didn't put the dots on the curve, but the green dots and the blue dots, you can see where this curve is, is, is more or less tangent to a conductance circle in two places and, and, and uh, likewise is tangent to a resistance circle in two places. Very interesting. Um, Doctor, I, I, Stearns, I think we're about to be- booted. We're ready. And- um, We'll continue. Uh, just Steve, I just Steve, I have just uh, started with the recording. Okay. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Hello, everyone. Thank you for rejoining. Um, Dr. Stearns has opened the floor for a few questions. If you want to raise, uh, ask a question, please use the reaction button near the bottom. Uh, of your Zoom window and raise your hand, like I'm doing now. And I'm lowering my hand. Shall we continue? Um, it, you know, we had about uh, 68 participants. Um, they're not all back, okay. They're not all back and it seems like they're still coming up. So if we wait just maybe 60 seconds, I would give people a chance to come back. Oh, we have a question from Ayush. I'll ask to unmute and you should be able to unmute Ayush. Yeah, hello, Steve. Uh, my question is, uh, wh what is the effect of antenna size on its impedance? And uh, from the context of electrically small antennas, uh, how do we uh, provide a good impedance match? That's a good question. That's a very good question. And people have, are working hard to handle electrically small antennas uh, and match them at the same time. Um, Electrically small antennas have a physical limitation um, set by the chew bound that relates their Q uh, to, the si to the physical size. And the Q of an antenna is bounded uh, by, the chew, by the chew formula. Um, there are some ways around the chew, the chew bound, but um, I think I'll just mention the newest, the newest way that is under research is what's called uh, direct antenna modulation or DAM or time switched antennas, time variable. They're trying to bypass the assumptions that are made in deriving the tube bound to figure out a way to make an antenna broadband. The things you can think of is, is uh, for a small, small antenna, the, the best conventional designs are ones that fill the space that the antenna occupies. So the, the Steve Best folded hemispherical helix is a very good design. Um, it, it pretty much fills the sphere or the hemisphere that it occupies. Um, but beyond that, um, the techniques for impedance matching antennas uh, that get, get beyond the normal bounds. Uh, Non-foster is one technique, but unfortunately non-foster has stability issues. Uh, which the community did not really understand very well. Uh, and even after papers were written to explain it, they still didn't seem to understand it very well. So there's a lot of, I'll call it misguided research into non-foster from people who didn't understand the papers that have already been written to explain the problems. Um, the, so the, the time variable antennas seem to be the best technique. Um, so, uh, let's see, to get an, uh, antennas that are naturally broadband, it's usually uh, a traveling wave type antenna. Um, another technique that's used to get constant resistance antennas is to use uh, antennas that have self-complementarity. Self-complementarity means that if you're, and this, this applies to antennas in a plane, 
uh, usually spiral or um, zigzag uh, antennas. Um, if you take the antenna, you rotate it, you change the metal to dielectric, change the dielectric to metal, the antenna is self-similar. So antennas that have this self-similarity process uh, or property uh, can have a constant resistance property. And then you make the antenna as big as it needs to be to cover the, both the high frequencies and the low frequencies of interest. Um, so self-similarity, that technique has been used a lot uh, in the past. But again, the, the current method that's being researched is, is modulated antennas, where you actually modulate the structure. Um, okay. Well, we all, looks like we're only going to get about 42, uh, so not everybody returned, but we will continue on from this point. Yes. Okay. Um, so I've explained uh, that the best series parallel RLC approximations occur at the R circle tangencies or the G circle tangencies. Those occur when the R and the G functions are at their extrema. Uh, in this case, minima, not maxima, but minima. And um, the best uh, series parallel RLC, the RLC approximations are not very good for modeling the antenna at resonance necessarily, uh, but they are good at these modeling at these other frequencies. Um, so you could have an antenna that's modeled by a bunch of different narrow band circuits and you, you switch among your models. But our goal is to have a single equivalent circuit that covers all frequencies rather than having a bunch of narrow band models or equivalent circuits for, for different regions uh, on the Smith chart. So, um, oh, this is uh, uh, for people that want to compute the extrema, uh, you get to solve these, in these uh, integral equations and that will give you um, uh, conditions for, for the extrema. We don't design to put the extrema, we don't design the antenna to create the extrema so that our models work. <laughs> we do it the other way around. Given the antenna, we model the antenna rather than trying to design the antenna to fit the model, we designed the model to fit the antenna. Um, let me show you some equivalent circuits that are defective. And these are broad, all broadband or attempts at broadband circuits. Um, Foster's first form, modified for small losses, and this was done at least three times in the literature, Tankian Gun in 1993, Hammett and Hammett in 1997, Rambabu, Ramesh, and uh, Kalhatji in 1999, all had variations on this circuit. Um, basically, you're just putting in resistors in the tank circuits in Foster's first form, uh, and then trying to make it fit the antenna impedance. The problem is, uh, it fits the dipole impedance near the anti-resonances, but not so good near the resonances. And that's visible on this plot, but it's also visible here where you can see the, the resonance, the value at the resonance is way off. Uh, they're not close. The blue curve is, is ground truth. The blue dashed curve is ground truth. The red curve is the model or the equivalent circuit, and it's just not a good it's not tracking the actual impedance well at all. You can do the same thing with Foster's second form. You can put in small losses. Uh, this business of small losses actually appears in some textbooks. Um, one EM textbook, Winery, Ramo Winery and Van Duzer uh, present this in a discussion of Shelkinoff's uh, methods. But anyway, it's not a very good method. Uh, McKinley used this for to same topology for circular loop antenna. I'll show that in a moment. Um, but here we are, we're fitting it to the dipole. It fits good, well near the resonances, but does not fit near the anti-resonances. And the badness of fit doesn't really show up on this chart because the anti-resonances are all squished to the right side of the chart, but uh, that fit is not good. The curve doesn't really track the shape of the, of the true antennas as it spirals around very well. So, and this is the best you could do with, with uh, an optimizer trying to force the model to fit the actual antenna. Another model that's been used in the past is this uh, long Werner and Werner broadband model. Um, I don't know how they came up with this model, 
Uh, they just tried stuff ad hoc until they sort of got it to fit. Unfortunately, it's got two negative capacitors in it, so it's a non-foster uh, circuit, so you could never build it. Um, but it doesn't even fit the antenna particularly well. For example, this antenna is resonant at 5.85 or 5.86, 4.86 megahertz. Uh, it's a half wavelength long at five megahertz. Here, the resonant frequency is above the half wavelength frequency. Uh, it's supposed to be below, so it's, it's just completely wrong. It's, it doesn't, it sort of looks right, but not really. Um, the resonant resistance is 96 ohms. And that's wrong. Um, it's much too high. Here's another one. This one is actually pretty close to, this is, a, this is not bad. We're getting close to the universal equivalent circuit idea, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, this, I don't know how they came up with this, but they came up with this, this circuit and it fits sort of okay. It, it uh, has a couple of hiccups, for example, the resistance is supposed to go to zero, and you see it rising at the low frequency end, and the third anti-resonant frequency is much too high. In the middle, it's, it's somewhat close. Um, but here's another gotcha. At a half wavelength, the impedance is um, way off. Uh, it's 88 plus, plus J47. The plus J47 is a big problem. And the 88 is a big problem uh, because for a thin dipole, the numbers need to be closer to about 72 plus J41, J41.5, which is a point on the Smith chart that all dipole impedances pass through very closely, regardless of fatness or thinness of the dipole. And so that's like a fixed point that's being missed by this impedance function. Um, Here's the loop antenna. This is, was proposed by McKinley for a large circular loop. It looks very interesting. In fact, it's the same Foster's second form with small losses that I presented earlier. And it, Bolanus's book on antennas, on the chapter on loop antennas, even cites this as a, as a nice result. Unfortunately, it's not a nice result. It turns out, if, when you read this carefully, that these things that are drawn as resistors, inductors, and capacitors are not lumped constant element devices. Uh, they're all functions of frequency. So what we have here is a, is a charade, um, a fake. Um, the circuit is drawn using schematic notation, which suggests that you have these resistances and reactances, but they're not, they're not circuit elements. They're not constant values and they vary with frequency. Well, if you allow that, if you allow that to be a circuit, then uh, the problem of finding an equivalent circuit is trivial. I'll just put in one resistor, one capacitor, one inductor, and write a more complicated formula for the component values and be done. Problem is solved. What this is really is a model. It's not an equivalent circuit, it's a model. It's a very cleverly disguised model because it's drawn to look like a circuit. So this is a, a fake. What's interesting about this is the problem that McKinley was solving, and this was published in 2012. The problem he was solving was a, to find a broadband equivalent circuit for a large circular loop antenna, but the problem was, had already been solved, and it was solved uh, by Blackburn in 1976. And McKinley, writing in the physics literature, was unaware of Blackburn's work in the antenna literature. Um, and so, the modes had already been worked out and they weren't the modes that this antenna implies. So the, the references are there at the bottom of the chart for anybody that wants to research the, uh, what happened. Um, we'll skip that one. So there's other problematic equivalent circuits and these equivalent circuits that are problematic uh, either use elements that are functions of frequency like the last model did. Uh, Witt did that. He put a a square law resistor in series with a transmission line stub and called that a dipole impedance. Well, the problem was the square law resistor doesn't exist as a realizable component. If you put in a constant resistance, then uh, you're restricting yourself to one of the R, constant R circles on the Smith chart and you can't actually track the antenna's impedance at all. 
you can match it at one point, but you can't track it over a band. Uh, the Long Werner and Werner I mentioned, Rudish, Sussman Fort is another bad one, Aberley and Romack, another bad one, Carras and Colin, uh, another bad one, McKinley White, Maxima Catchpole, uh, another bad one. So these are all, there are plenty of what I'll call flaky equivalent circuits in the literature. The term equivalent circuit, I'm, res I'm reserving the word for passive realizable circuit models based on classical lumped element uh, R's, L's, and C's. Um, and if you want to include mutual inductance, that's allowed, although it's dispensable. It's not necessary. Uh, I ranked them all at one point, but this table was before many of those effective ones were, were known to me. So uh, the, even this table is not complete, uh, but it shows uh, for some of the simpler ones, the kind of bandwidths that are possible. Uh, this was pub published or presented, it was actually presented at AWRL Pacificon more than once um, over the years. In back around 2007 and maybe 2005, Let's have an interlude on bells. How many minutes do we have left? Anybody? Uh, I'm guessing uh, 20. Okay, well, we'll do bells and then maybe take one more break. We'll see how we get. Large bells are found in churches, cathedrals, monasteries, and public buildings. You may wonder what this has to do with antennas and we'll, that'll become apparent. Uh, bell weights for large bells can range from 300 pounds to 202 tons. And in fact, there's one that's claimed to be 300 tons that's been lost in Burma, the lost bell of Burma. Uh, but the 202 is a real bell and we're looking at a picture of it. It's called the Tsar bell or number three, number three Tsar bell. The first one was cast in the 17th century. Uh, it weighed 20 tons and then uh, a fire broke out uh, it fell to the ground, was destroyed. Uh, does anybody know that building in the background? Well, it's on the slide. It's the Kremlin. So this is in Moscow. Um, the first Tsar Bell uh, was destroyed in the uh, 18th century. It was recast. Um, and um, they made it bigger. They made, they made it 100 tons. Uh, got it installed and again, a fire broke out and the bell was destroyed. Uh, well, third time is the charm normally. Uh, so Empress uh, Anna, uh, the niece of Peter the Great, um, commissioned to have the bell rebuilt for the third time. This time they again upped the weight now to 202 tons. Uh, they found somebody who could cast it. No, none of the bell foundries knew how to do a bell that big. They got a, a fellow who was experienced in making cannons and he cast the bell and they built a big pit. Uh, the bell was in the pit at the foundry. Um, lo and behold, the foundry caught fire. Uh, the bell had bronze, which has a low melting point. They were worried that the bell would melt. Uh, the guards threw water all over the bell, cracked the bell. Later on, the supports that were holding the bell up burned through and the bell crashed to the ground and fell into the pit and it stayed there. The bell was fractured in 11 places and it stayed in the pit for one century. Um, in the 19th century, there were several attempts to pull the bell out. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, tried to take the bell with him. And when he was in Moscow in 1812, uh, he tried to lift the bell. He was gonna take it back to France as a trophy. Uh, it was too heavy. Um, so it stayed. And finally, a few years later, they were able to get the bell out uh, and they put it on a concrete pedestal. Uh, the chunk that's missing is actually there on the ground behind those people. That's about 10 or 11 tons. So it's about 5% of the total weight of that bell. Um, that's the biggest one, except that we, we believe that there are some bigger ones in Japan, possibly and in Indonesia, maybe in Korea. Uh, the one in Burma 
uh, that was 300 tons uh, uh, fell into a, a river. It's actually a funny story. Um, uh, that bell, uh, a Portuguese adventurer tried to steal it from Burma. Uh, they succeeded in rolling it down, or down they, they got it down out of the tower, they rolled it down a hill, they got it down to a raft. Uh, he had a boat that was pulling it across with a bell on the raft behind the boat. Um, it was the flagship. Um, the raft sank and the boat was pulled under because the bell was so heavy, it, it sank the boat. So the boat that was towing the bell sank with the bell. Um, later on, the Burmese captured the, this guy that stole the bell and, and uh, nothing good happened to him. He was uh, summarily executed. Uh, but that bell is lost. They, they, they thought they knew where it was. There have been multiple attempts to try to relocate it and raise it, but it's still underwater somewhere, the lost bell. The adventurers are looking for it because it contains a lot of precious metals. There was a lot of gold, silver, and other precious metals into the, that went into these big bells. So there's gold hunters that are searching hard to find that bell and figure out a way to raise it. But this is the current biggest bell. This bell has an interesting history. Uh, it also has another interesting fact. Because it was destroyed on its, as it was being made, it has never been rung. So the largest bell that we have uh, has never been rung. Uh, I'll continue that story in a moment. But first, let's look at the bell shapes vary uh, by country and by foundry. So there's various empirical formulas, shapes that have been arisen through history. Uh, different countries have bells. Big bells are made of different shapes. You can nowadays use finite element of uh, method, FEM, uh, using a program like ANSYS Mechanical used to be called ANSYS modal. Um, you can actually model the bell and see the vibrational modes of the bell. Um, the key thing about the sound of the bell is that it's not simple. Uh, the transient response has an early and a late part to it. The early response, when you first hit the bell, the early response is, is sort of rough and discordant, but it quickly, you develop into all the harmonics, the tones, the modes, uh, they all have different decay rates. So they all decay, but with different rates. Um, but there's at least five that are audible to, a, to the trained ear. They're called the hum, the prime, the tierce, the quint, and the nominal. And if you wait long enough, as the bell gets fainter and fainter, uh, you will hear just the, the part of the transient response you hear is the one that decays the slowest, and that's almost always it's the hum. Sometimes it's the prime and the hum together. So those, so the bell becomes increasingly pure and sinusoidal the longer you listen. Um, so you can simulate these bells. Well, since we can simulate bells with the finite element method, um, it happens that a group of researchers, I believe it was UC Berkeley, as students like to do things that are novel, they thought, well, the czar bell has never been rung. Let's, why don't we ring it anyway? We're gonna ring it digitally. So they constructed a finite element model of the czar bell. They, they used the dimensions and the properties and the materials, uh, uh, simulated the, the bell, got its transient response. They set up a huge bank of loudspeakers at the Camp Adil on the Berkeley campus. Um, they had more than a dozen speakers and high-powered amplifiers, and these were subwoofers because they had to reproduce all the, the notes the bell produced. And they actually played the bell in April of 2016. The czar bell sound was playing from the Campanile on the Berkeley campus, um, which is quite stunning. The Russians were very upset. They thought that stealing the sound of the bell was sacrilegious, uh, so there were complaints. but. That is that story. Um, bells are tuned, big bells are tuned. They're not just cast and rung, they're tuned. And here you see a vertical lathe uh, tuning the bell. They tune this bell to raise or lower the partials, partial tones to put them on frequency to get the proper effect. And so here's two pictures. In the old days, it was done by a guy with a hammer and a chisel, and it wasn't done very accurately. The new bells, uh, sound much better because they can 
tune them mechanically. And again, the experts that do this know exactly how much metal to remove and where, what part of the bell to remove it from in order to control those five notes that I mentioned, put them in the proper, on the proper frequencies and in the proper amounts. And here's a spectrum of a tuned bell. Uh, this bell is tuned for a somber, melancholy sound because the tierce, the D-sharp note is high and the, uh, the quint note, the G6 note is very low. So this is not a happy bell. This is a solemn, melancholy sounding bell. And with that, we're ready to talk about equivalent circuits, universal equivalent circuits. Antennas and electromagnetic devices in general have complex frequencies. They have poles and zeros uh, in the right half of the complex frequency plane. So here we have impedance uh, poles, uh, and these are actually for spheres. These pictures are for spheres, the electric modes and the magnetic modes. And the further you go to the left on those graphs, the, the faster the decay rate, and the further you go to the right, the slower the decay rate. And the higher you go vertically, the higher the pitch, and the lower you go, the lower the pitch. So we have real frequency on the vertical axis. We have the complex frequency on the horizontal axis. Um, when you apply an impulse to a structure like a bell or an antenna, you get an early response. That gives way to uh, all the modes eventually pop up and you've got the, the complicated transient response, the late response of all the, of all the sounds decaying at different rates. Um, here we have the natural frequencies of a dipole antenna. This was worked out in 1973 by Frederick Tesh. Um, and he shows that the natural frequencies can be arranged into layers. Um, so he organizes them into layers and he shows where they are. And if you're computing the impedance function, you're concerned with the poles that are close to that J omega axis. And you're concerned with the ones that are further away, but not as much. Uh, the, the ones that are close to the axis are the ones that determine most of your impedance behavior. But the interesting thing is that these natural frequencies are infinite, but they are countably infinite. So there's a countable infinity of natural frequencies. And if you can uh, replicate those, uh, add them up in the proper amounts, which is determined by the resi the residues of these uh, singularities, then you can replicate the, the response. Here's the same thing done for the loop antenna. This is for a large, electrically large loop where we have the admittance poles. Uh, and again, th this was worked out by Blackburn in 1978 in his doctoral dissertation and, and subsequent uh, IEEE articles. Um, and he's shown how you can organize them into families and he's computed what they are and explained the method of computation. And again, there's a finite number of, not a finite number, but there's an infinite number, but it's a countable infinity of, of these natural frequencies. That gets us to the topic, which I'm not gonna go into much, meromorphic functions. We all know what uh, the poles and zeros are of a rational function. Uh, if the rational function has a polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator, the polynomial in the denominator can be factored and its factors give a finite number of factors depending on the degree of the polynomial and those become the poles. So there's a finite number of poles. A meromorphic function is a generalization of that idea, except that the number of poles is not finite, it's infinite, but it's countably infinite. All the poles are isolated in the sense that there are no cluster points, there are no ridge singularities. The only thing, kind, kind of singularity there is are poles, simple poles, um, that are isolated. That is, around every pole, there's an open neighborhood that contains no other poles. Um, and if we consider positive real functions, so we add pa the passivity constraint, uh, then we're gonna get all the poles lie in the left half of the complex S plane. Uh, F conjugate of S is F of F conjugate. Uh, the real part of F of, uh, is non-negative. All the poles are simple. And examples are um, positive real rational functions are a subset of this class of functions I'm describing. Complex exponentials are. 
trigonometric functions are, hyperbolic functions are. Many of the special functions of mathematical ph physics are meromorphic functions. In fact, most of them are. Let's see if we can get this. There we go. Uh, the mittag leffler theorem gives an expansion theorem for how to expand um, uh, meromorphic functions uh, in a um, series form. We won't get into that, how that works. But the consequence for us is that if we have an impedance function that's meromorphic, it can be transcendental. It doesn't have to be finite, rational. It can be any transcendental impedance function as long as it's meromorphic. It can be represented by an infinite structure made up of stages that look like one of these four types of stages. The two on the top, we'll call them uh, stages for, a, for something that's very similar to Foster's second form. So we'll call them type two parallel ladders. We, we put stages like this together side by side in a ladder. There's no, there's no um, series elements in the ladder, it's just parallel stages. So we get Foster's second form, but we get it with these elements instead of with Foster's uh, uh, stages. The two on the bottom, we can stack these up in series, connect them in series, so we have an infinite uh, ladder of stages of the two on the bottom. And the claim is that every meromorphic passive impedance function, whether it's an antenna or a microwave device, can be represented in these forms. And in addition, we have the mittag leffler theorem that uh, guarantees, a, guarantees that if we truncate the structure, we have a bounded error. Uh, so we commit an error, an error that can be made as small as we want. In other words, we can fit the antenna impedance with one of these four ladders as closely as we want, um, and then truncate it, and then the error will be small, as small as we want. And this is over any arbitrary bandwidth whatsoever. So let's see how this works. Uh, the type one I've explained, it's these stages connect, connected in series. Some number of them, we're gonna truncate it so it's a finite number, uh, but the full meromorphic function, it would be an infinite structure that goes on forever. With the type two stages, it looks like this, uh, this type of a structure. Now, the, neither, none of these structures uh, are in Darlington form because every stage has got two resistors. Nonetheless, once I've truncated the circuit, it's, got a, it's representable as a rational function, and that rational function can be re-expanded by Darlington synthesis to a structure that has a single resistor. So I can use the Darlington theorem uh, or synthesis algorithm to convert these, any of these, to Darlington form uh, once it's been determined. Uh, so the reasons, again, I'll say that all, all impedances can, be, if, you, if you're doing impedances by analysis, you always write the impedance in terms of formulas that involve special functions. And most of the special functions of mathematical physics are meromorphic and meromorphic functions are closed under sums, products, quotients, and powers. So it's almost guaranteed that any analytical formula for an impedance is going to be meromorphic and therefore can be expanded by these equivalent circuits. Conversely, if you're dealing with numerical data or measured data, uh, the impedance determined by uh, uh, the standard procedure is to apply signal processing algorithms to do a pole, a pole residue extraction from the measured data. The two popular techniques are the Prony method and the matrix pencil method. Both of those methods determine poles and residues and they work successfully. So the mere fact that you can take measured data or numerically computed data and apply the Prony or the matrix pencil methods and extract the poles and zeros uh, is further proof that uh, the impedance data you started with could be represented as a meromorphic function. Now, we're not ruling out exceptions, but it's just that none are, none are known, none have been discovered. So in that sense, I'm gonna claim that, that the circuits that I just showed you are universal for all devices. 
and to back it up, here's the some of the there's a very large list of special functions, all of which are meromorphic or analytic. And these are the functions, kinds of functions that, that if you were to do analysis on a structure, you'd, you'd be using these functions and you'd be adding and subtracting, dividing and multiplying them. Those operations uh, give you meromorphic functions for results. So let's say it's an act of faith, but universal as far as we know. Let's demonstrate this with some examples. Transmission lines are not antennas, but let's do stubs first uh, because uh, everybody likes stubs. Um, open stub, here's an open stub of length L, complex propagation constant gamma. Gamma is alpha plus J beta, alpha is the uh, attenuation constant, beta is the uh, phase constant. Uh, we can see that the, uh, if we, were, if we were to, if the line had a delay tau from one end to the other, we could compute L and C numbers or parameters and then plug into the formulas shown on the elements in the picture, construct our infinite ladder, and then decide to truncate our infinite ladder at some point. And if we do, and here I've done it for you in, um, it's for a lossless stub, so the resistors are absent, and this particular stub is an open circuit stub. Uh, it's a quarter wavelength long at one megahertz. And there we are. This is a one megahertz stub. I've included how many stages? Uh, eight or 10 stages. And so it's good up to a certain point, eight or 10 times one megahertz, and then it falls off. The true stub is the gray curve in the background and the equivalent circuit is the dashed red curve in, that's in the foreground. And so this is for 50 ohm stub. We can do the same thing for shorted stub. The circuit is the dual. Uh, there's no need to simulate this, but the result would be the same, that it will track out as far as we want to whatever point we, we stop adding stages. Let's do another example, thin wire dipole antenna. Let's go back to our original uh, 100 foot dipole antenna and fit it from zero to 30 megahertz. And there's the equivalent circuit, the values that are determined by fitting an op using an optimizer to fit to the impedance data are there. And there we have uh, the neck two computed data is the black dashed curve that's in the background. The red curve on top of it, the foreground is the equivalent circuit. They track quite well, zero to 30. And here we show it Cartesian coordinates. We've got the real and the imaginary parts uh, of both resistance and, and reactance on the left and uh, conductance and susceptance on the right and return loss on the bottom. And you can see the, the uh, equivalent circuit tracks the antenna quite well over through these multiple resonances. Um, we're going to be booted out and we'll do the restart. Uh, I apologize again. All attendees, please just rejoin the meeting. I'll be restarting it soon. Uh, but I think we should just sort of hold here. Okay, this is a good stopping point between examples. And, and it, there we go. It's going. Thank okay. You. Is there another Any question? Questions? Um, yes, sir. I, have, I just have one quick question for Steve. Go ahead. Uh, sir, basically, uh, I'm actually in a beginner engineering student, so I just wanted to understand if, uh, could you comment on the circuit impedance of an antenna circuit and the interference between antenna signals? Is there a correlation between that, like the circuit impedance of an antenna circuit and the interference between signals? Well, there's a, the, the answer is that the interference is, is determined by mutual coupling between the antennas. Uh, and so we can write the, the, we can write formulas that explain what that interference is and it will involve the impedance of the antenna. But um, that, that's how you do it. You, you basically have to write 
down the mutual coupling between the antennas. You treat the problem as a two port, one antenna couples to another antenna and, and with, with the propagation medium in the middle. It could even be two antennas in an array. You could have a phased array which got two antennas side by side and they mutually couple. In fact, an interesting question is, uh, if one antenna in the array is terminated with a preamp with electronics that is noisy, can that, can that noise get re-radiated into a neighboring antenna so that the neighboring antenna sees some noise coming from its, from it, its neighbor in the array? But in any case, yeah, this problem arises a lot. It's, it's, it's a, I'll call it link analysis. <laughs> it's a link analysis problem where you're computing how much of the radiation from one antenna gets into the second antenna. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Stern, question? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, you had mentioned earlier in your presentation today about a electrically small antenna that quote filled the available space. I understood. What was you named that antenna? I would love to research that. What is that name of that antenna? Oh, that was due to Steve Best, B E S T. Steve was the president of the IEEE APS Society about a decade ago. I'm guessing around 2010 or maybe 2009. But that was his antenna. He did that work with Art Yajian. Uh, it's a folded hemispherical helix. And it's one of the antennas that's been proposed as an example of an antenna that efficiently uses the volume that it's in to get as high a bandwidth as is possible. Uh, I am trying to remember what that bandwidth is. Maybe it's 30%, 33% on that order. Um, but the complete theoretical analysis is in the paper. Great. Thank you for providing that. I, have, I think I have sufficient information to, to hunt it down. Thank you. Okay. Yes. And another person to, to look at is, um, well, actually, there's a book. Uh, I'll just refer you to Bob Hansen's book, R.C. Hansen's book. Uh, the first edition uh, had a green cover. The second edition he co-authored with Bob Collin has a gold cover, color, gold colored cover. Uh, and it's about electrically small antennas. Um, and it has a whole chapter on electrically small antennas and, and, and uh, as well as super cool, super conducting antennas and other, other stuff. And uh, who, who was the lead author of that book? Bob. Bob uh, Hansen, R.C. Okay. Hansen. Let's go to uh, Ken Manders for questions. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Steve, now that you have some equivalent circuit impedance model of a, an antenna, kind of begs the question, can I take this information and use it such that I can make a broadband matching network? So yes. The, whatever the ugliness is of this antenna, maybe it's a long wire. I get it on the other side of the network to be, you know, maybe 50 ohms or whatever the normalized impedance is. Is that yes. a... That's yes. a solved problem. That's a solved problem. <laughs> oh, it's good. A, it's a solved problem. But unfortunately, I, I'll tell you the solution. It's a very simple solution. You can represent the antenna impedance in Darlington form as a lossless reactance two port terminated by a resistor. What you do to make the broadband matching network is you connect in cascade with that lossless two port, another two port, which is your matching network. And it has to be a mathematical inverse to the antenna's two port. Yeah. So you have two, two, two ports in cascade. One is the inverse of the, of the other. And when you work out what it is, it, it, it gives you a, uh, a closed form prescription for um, a non-foster matching network that in principle matches the antenna over infinite frequency. So uh, that, that's the solution that was presented. I don't know, it's presented in my papers on non, my early papers on non-foster impedance matching. It's also presented in um, some of the other works, the more mathematical works on non-foster impedance matching. So we know that solution. Now the question is, if you don't allow non-foster elements, then, then it, that solution is not a, it's not usable, then you're back to figuring out some other way to get around the Fano bound. Um, the Fano bound applies to uh, passive lossless uh, 
networks. And, and so um, to the extent that the antenna is both passive and lossless, you have that bound on its, so you, you've got to, you've got to um, come up with a, with a, it's not the antenna that needs to be passive and lossless, it's the matching network that has to be passive and lossless. So if the, so the matching network, you can either throw away the require, requirement that it be um, lossless and make it active. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, so you you can see the directions we're going. We're going in directions that, that are going to be hard to implement. Yeah. So, 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 did you? Question. I think we should get to that other question if we could. Okay. Yeah, let, let me go for a little bit longer there. So, have you ever made one of these, what I call a can of uh, inductors and capacitors, and had the thing work? Yeah, these are. It's like building a, a, a high order filter with multi stages. It's it's a lot of trimming, trimming and tweaking. But basically, you do it a stage at a time with a network analyzer. You look at your results, you trim and tweak each stage before you add the next stage. Uh, you, you can certainly compute in advance all the component values to umpteen decimal digits. Um, <laughs> but to build it, it's, 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 it's much more like building a high order filter. If you've ever, ever built a, a, uh, a tenth order or Chebyshev or. or um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've filter. done that. Yeah, so then you, I'm gonna I'm gonna butt out of here. I'm gonna listen to you some more. But is it okay if I email contact you about said subject? Yeah, sure, that's fine. Email Thank is you. Stearns at IEEE.org. Works just fine. Okay, okay. go go for Board it. Board chart, did you want to ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, just two simple questions. Uh, you had mentioned a Bodhi Fano limit for lossless matching networks earlier. You mentioned a, a gentleman's well, someone's name for uh, a limit on lossy uh, networks, and it was something like Carno, maybe. I'm wondering if you could, if you could give me the reference on that, or just the name. Yeah, Carlin La Rosa, Carlin La Rosa bound. It's basically Thanos bound dealt, dealt with reflection re bounds on reflection bandwidth. The Carlin uh -huh. La Rosa bound deals with a uh, uh, constraint on uh, transmission networks. Uh, Transmission bandwidth through a network. Okay, and that's Carlin La Rosa? Carlin. Yeah, and Carlin is Herbert Carlin, the famous okay. network theorist. La Rosa was one of his grad students. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll yeah. that. Second okay. simple question. Are, are you getting the um, RLC values for the equivalent networks here on, on the slide you're showing right now? Is that through some optimization process? Yeah, let's see if we can go back one slide because it was actually on the slide. Went forward. Let's go backwards. Back, backwards, backwards. There we go. And where did we put the values? There they are. There's the values, no, and that and that's determined by an optimizer. Okay, I just it's an optimization process. Okay, thank right. you. Right. Yeah. In this case, I know the topology. Mm -hmm. The beauty of this approach is I know the topology of the circuit, so I just use an optimizer to uh, compute the values. Okay. If you didn't know the topology, then you're back in like the, the section before this of right. all the defective circuits where people hmm. were, were doing ad hoc things. I understand. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's go back to our next antenna, which is a tuned loop. This is a small loop. Uh, for the hams, this is a similar to what's called an Alex loop. But what it is, it's two loops, a small loop that's inductively couples to a larger loop. The larger loop is resonant with a series capacitor. The small loop is is the driven loop, and it's it's impedance matched. And there's a picture of it there. You can see the two loops, the little loop and the big loop. Um, this particular model came out of an article in QEX magazine, the July 2018 article, and I just took the uh, took the model that they gave. They they gave a neck model, and I just took it, and used it. So there's their impedance and here we can see the loop swept from one megahertz to 30 megahertz the loop is supposed to be resonant in the 20 meter band which is 14.1 megahertz and it you can see it's pretty close to the origin uh we'll see in a moment that that is in fact 14.1 megahertz or thereabouts uh, but this is the the raw neck 2 data 
here is the equivalent circuit that turns out to fit it quite well. Now, in this case, I didn't need a whole bunch of stages. It turns out that this antenna is so simple, it fits with a single stage. And in fact, that stage only needs one resistor. So there's only one resistor in the whole model. Uh, by the way, I should explain this L naught inductor that you see at the front. Remember I said I was going to truncate the um, infinite, the infinite ladder, I was going to truncate it to a finite number of stages. In so doing, um, I can add something simple to compensate for all the stages that are missing. So because I didn't implement an infinite ladder, I infinited a finite ladder, I'll just lump all the, all the missing terms into a single, into something simple. And in this case, the something simple is designed to make the antenna fit either at the origin, at infinity, or somehow compensate for all the missing terms. So it's like a fudge factor. Um, so in this case, I've got a lead inductor, and then that's followed by an RLC circuit. And this is the exact optimizer screen showing the setup for the optimizer. And I can't remember, I either use Nelder Mead or I use Particle Swarm. I use probably switched back and forth. I run the optimizer many times, different ways, play with the cost function or the weighting on the different elements of the cost function till I get the fit that I want. But then I'm done. And so this is the final result. Now, because this circuit has a single resistor, I can redraw the circuit to make that resistor the output of a two port and put the series LC uh, in a series arm. So my whole topology will then look like a pi topology with a, a lead inductor, a shunt inductor at the front end, a shunt resistor at the back end and a series LC in the middle. And so that's exactly what I'll do eventually, but let's first look at the performance. This proves that it tracks from what, one megahertz to 30 megahertz a simple equivalent circuit. What we're showing is that the universal equivalent circuit reduces to a simple special case and it tracks the antenna quite well. The next two data is in black in the back and the equivalent circuit data is the dashed red line in the foreground. Here I've redrawn the circuit on the left as I described it, a shunt inductor, a uh, series LC and then and then the output port. So I can treat this, this is in Darlington form as is. I don't have to do anything special to convert it to Darlington form. Now I wanna compare it to what's on the right. The right on the right is a, I'll call it an orthodox model, physical model for this electrically small antenna. And it's out of that same issue of QEX magazine. It's by a different author, by, uh, but it's out of the same magazine. And, um, we're gonna show that that model also fits. What, what's the difference? Well, the difference is in the parts count. Uh, we have one circuit that takes four elements, the other circuit takes five. Now that trio of inductors at the front end or the feed, near the feed point, that's really a transformer. That's a T, T equivalent circuit for a transformer because this other equivalent circuit has a transformer uh, in that location. And then the transformer feeds it. It's just an RC circuit. So the question is, which is simpler? Well, I'll contend that the universal equivalent circuit model with four elements is, is the simpler circuit. Um, it has lower complexity. Um, the accuracy of, of both is the same, and this shows it. Here, this may be hard to see on your screen. I don't know if everybody can see it, but there's three curves overlaid. There's a fat black curve in the background. That's the antenna, the raw antenna data as computed by Nick too. There's a medium width red curve on top of that. That's the four element universal equivalent circuit. And there's a thin yellow curve in front of that. And that's the five element conventional equivalent circuit that has the transformer. They all track perfectly well from one megahertz to 30 megahertz. Um, so that's that example. Now, uh, the next example will have a large untuned loop. Here it is. This is an untuned loop. It's 23 feet in diameter. The wire is number 12 wire. It's in free space. There's no ground. It's a one-turn loop. It's designed for the same frequency 
as the previous example was designed for 20 meter ham band or 14.1 megahertz operation. I'm gonna do two different equivalent circuits, universal equivalent circuits. I'll do a, a type one and a type two equivalent circuit. So this is the type one equivalent circuit set up by the optimizer. The program I'm using, by the way, is very similar to ADS, but it's a tool, uh, it sort of replaces the free version of Ansoft Serenade that people used to use. This is called Quux Studio, and that's a free download. So this program you can get for free. <clears throat> it's a full featured harmonic balance circuit simulator with a lot of capability. Um, there's no reason to pay you know, $50,000 for one seat on ADS or microwave office when you've got this kind of tool available for free. Um, okay, let's look at how it performs. There's uh, the type two equivalent circuit. These are actually showing the optimization setup, but also showing the final values that were determined. And there they are. Uh, the type one ladder does not fit quite as well as the type two parallel ladder. The type two parallel ladder fits a little bit better than the type one ladder. I'm plotting these curves from 10 kilohertz to 30 megahertz, and uh, I guess three, three turns on the Smith chart. And there we have um, in Cartesian coordinates, uh, the resistance, the reactance, the conductance, the susceptance, and the return loss for the type one circuit and for the type two circuit. And the, again, the type two circuit is essentially perfect, a perfect fit to the, to the antenna. So we fitted now a small tuned loop and a large untuned loop, a dipole. <clears throat> Let's do our disc cone. Here's the disc cone equivalent circuit. You've already seen the picture of the disc cone. Everybody knows what it's like. This is a type one equivalent circuit set up for the disc cone. This is a circuit determined and there it is. And the fit's not quite perfect, but it's pretty good. It fits the resonance quite nicely. I think maybe a few more stages, one or two more stages, or maybe even one or two more elements, not a full stage, but just part of a stage uh, would probably pull this, pull this model in so it would fit perfectly. Uh, my last example, and we're, we are definitely near the end of this because this is the last example. Uh, we're we're going to do another dipole. This time it'll be a VHF dipole, uh, one meter long, uh, with an L over D ratio of 50. So it's a fat dipole. And I'm going to plot, I'm going to do this dipole. That dipole is resonant at 150 megahertz. I'm going to fit, fit it up to a gigahertz. Um, Double check what I actually use. Yeah, it looks 1500 megahertz. I'm gonna go from 150. Actually, I'm gonna fit it from one megahertz to 1.5 gigahertz. So I'm gonna fit it through a bunch of resonances. And this is the most ambitious example of the lot. Now, what's interesting when you use an optimizer is it turns out some of the component values for the resistors converge to extremely small numbers and they can be replaced by zero which means that they're not really in the circuit. If they're, series, if they're in series elements, they're just short, replaced by short circuits. Other resistor values converge to infinity and they can be replaced by open circuits and just removed entirely. So this shows you a red cross through one of the resistors that is, can be eliminated. Uh, and the first one, two, three, four stages have, and also the sixth stage have resistors series resistors can all be replaced by short circuits, which is, reduces the resistor count. So they're just not needed for the, for the model to fit. Okay, so here we have the, oh, this is for the disc cone. This slide is out of order. Um, yeah, slide is out of order. This, this belongs to the previous example, so we'll skip it. Here we have the one meter dipole. And here you can see the fit on the Smith chart. You see we have one resonance and one anti-resonance. And because the dipole is fat, it spirals downward. So all the rest of the spirals are in the lower half of the Smith chart. So it only has one resonance and one anti-resonance. 
Nevertheless, we're tracking it quite well with the equivalent circuit from one megahertz to 1.5 gigahertz. And that first resonance point corresponds to about 150 megahertz. And here we are in Cartesian coordinates again, showing resistance, reactance, conductance, and susceptance. And you can see that the uh, model, the equivalent circuit fits almost perfectly on top of the actual NEC2 data for this antenna. Um, that's my last example. I'll just comment that if you're doing these kinds of experiments with, with uh, software, uh, your CEM programs, your computational electromagnetics programs, whether they're using NEC uh, or WIPLD or FICO or, or um, any of the mo moment method frequency domain programs, your computed emittance data will either be um, admittance data or impedance data in real and imaginary form. That's the form that's native to the program, but you can export it. Um, in S parameter form. Uh, you may want to export it in S parameter form, depending on what you're going to import that file into later, because many circuit programs will only accept S parameters, but it's some, some will actually take general touchstone file formats and they'll accept admittance and resistance parameters as well. So it depends on where you're going to go with your data. But in general, for Quark Studio, I always convert to S parameter form because so I make an S1P or an S2P file. I store S parameter data, always store it in uh, real and imaginary form or in dB, never in magnitude and amplitude because with you get close to the perimeter of the Smith chart, your S parameter goes, magnitude might go to 0 0.99999, six nines. What's left over is, is, is just four digits. So your significance of, of your resultant, you're, you, you've just thrown away. You know, if, if your floating point mantissa was, was 10 decimal digits, you've just thrown away six of them. You have four left. So you lose precision quickly if you use magnitude amplitude and you're working near the edge of the Smith chart, which is what you do if you're working with electrically small antennas. So um, always use real and imaginary or DB or better yet use real, use resist, resistance and reactance or conductance and susceptance if the EDA program will allow that. Um, that's enough on EDA programs. They're all different. You gotta, you gotta know how to use each one to get your data in and out of them. Um, so what's our conclusion? Our conclusion is that emittance or admittance, impedance, admittance or impedance representations of, an, of one port networks, electromagnetic structures, antennas, or microwave devices, they have broadband lumped element equivalent circuits. Those circuits can be represented as a generalized ladder network with either rungs or styles, rungs being type two, styles being type one, of, of subnetworks, and there's only four possible subnetworks um, that can handle all cases. So there's really just one of four equivalent circuits that will fit your antenna, whatever it is. Um, now, technically, it only applies to meromorphic impedance functions, but in practice, that seems to be everything, as far as we know. Nothing's been, no non meromorphic impedance function is known or has been discovered in, in the physical world. Um, the element values of your equivalent circuit can be set a couple of different ways. Semi-analytical, uh, if you have a way to compute the poles and zeros, then by analysis, you can, once you have the poles and, uh, you don't need both poles and zeros, you need poles or zeros, but once you have one or the other and the residues, then you can uh, compute the element values directly by formula. Or the other way is, is don't do anything mathematical, just use an optimizer and fit to numerical data. And that's what I showed in most of my, all actually all of my examples, except for the transmission line examples, those were actually uh, set by formula. The parts values in the first two transmission line stub examples were set by formula. The parts values in all of the subsequent examples were set by optimizers. Uh, if you're making a two-port antenna emulator for doing a non-radiating transmission test, 
uh, you have to do one extra step, which is to take the equivalent circuit, the universal equivalent circuit, and convert it into Darlington form to get a network that you can realize with the radiation resistance being uh, lumped into one resistor, which then becomes the port, the port terminating impedance. Um, so that extra step, I did not discuss it, but it's in the literature, it's classical. It was in Darlington's uh, 1937 uh, PhD dissertation and subsequent publications out of AT, uh, at and Bell Telephone Laboratories. So we are done, I believe. Let's uh, go forward one more slide, I think. Oh, references. This is the one slide you may want to um, take a photograph of or copy or hit shift print screen on your computer right oh, now. Dr. Dr. Stearns, uh, uh, my, my understanding was we would be able to distribute these slides. Is that not the case? I'm going to, I'm going to give you the link to the slides. Um, I'll put them on my, on my server. That allows me to make corrections and revisions. But then I'll give you the link so you can go there anytime. So that that will work just fine. Um, so I won't be getting a copy of the slide deck itself, but we'll be distributing a link to your your server. Is that what you would like to do? That will work better. That will work right. better. Well, I'll put uh, okay. I, the slides. Are, I put all of my presentations on one server, so they're all there. You can look at that this presentation or any of the others. Uh, it'll be a downloadable PDF. Oh, thank so all you very you, much. Okay. All you will need is uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll work with that. Um, by the way, uh, just on that same theme, just while we're on that topic, uh, we are recording this meeting, and we will stitch together the various chunks of forty-minute Zoom licensing, which we need to stumble through, and create one um, video file. And our, our normal practice, if you're okay with it, is to distribute that to the registrants. Yes, that's fine. That, that's, that's a good way to do it. And actually the talk tells you a lot more than just the, looking at the slides do. The slides illustrate the talk, but they aren't the talk. The talk is my words. Right. You, yeah. You've got those I really captured. Appreciate this. Yeah, so um, I, I um, anyway, I, I, if you, I do notice one hand up and we, we're counting down for eight to eight minutes to the end of the evening. Uh, so I don't know if you had a few more words you'd like to go into. Uh, or we'd like to take a couple of uh, questions. Quick. We'll, we'll take questions now. Uh, the last slide just says the end. So, okay. Very <laughs> so good. we don't uh, need this slide. I'll, Daniel I'll, Peters? Yes, go, go ahead. ahead. Yes, Dr. Stern, you had mentioned a, the optimizer, a free optimizer. I know it's not a, uh, an endorsement, uh, but it's just an example. Which one uh, did you mention? I actually mentioned two, uh, Ansoft Serenade student version is no longer uh, supported, but it can still be found um, online. But a much better, more modern one is Quux, Quux, Q-U-C-S Studio. Quux Studio, uh, there is also Quux, but Quux is, has been superseded by Quux Studio. In my opinion, Quux Studio is the better choice because it's, um, controlled. It's, it's, it, the development is controlled. Quex is open source and, and a lot of different programmers have contributed in, uh, what's the word, contradictory or incompatible little bits of software in there. So it's sort of got worse over time. So Quex Studio is the one to get. And that was Q-U-C-X. Yes, Q-U-C-S. And that, that's an acronym. It stands for Quite, Quite Universal Circuit Simulator. Perfect. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, next question from MD. Uh, hello. Thank you for your presentation. So I have one question. So when you were saying that you want to truncate the circuit and you were using an inductor to represent the truncation, so I was wondering why, why did you choose an uh, inductor? Why not a capacitor? What is the reasoning behind using the inductor in particular? Oh. Um. It, 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 in that case, it may, have been, it may have been to control what happens at infinity. I think I wanted a zero at infinity, not a pole. And if I hadn't put it in there, I would have had a pole at infinity. So 
whether you want the curve to go off to infinity or go off to zero as you go infinitely high in frequency, that determines it. And the other thing is uh, you want to get the best fit in the, in the range of frequencies of interest. Uh, you could leave it off completely, but in this case, putting, putting it in uh, just sort of improve things overall. Uh, the other thing is you just, you can always just keep adding stages until you're happy and not, and not fiddle with special components. Let the optimizer tell you if it wants all the components in a particular stage to, to disappear and only keep one. So that's another way to do it. Just like in the, in the short, in the short or the small loop problem, I think I started with two stages and the optimizer quickly decided that it didn't need all the components in one stage. So all the series components went to zero and the uh, parallel components went to infinity. So it only, and it only kept the inductor. So the optimizer actually gave me the answer. And then what I presented to you was the final result. So it's a good idea to always just use complete stages uh, and just keep adding, st in, start with a narrow bandwidth, fit the antenna over a narrow bandwidth using one stage and then freeze that stage and add a second stage and widen the bandwidth and then freeze that stage, widen the bandwidth and just keep slowly building up and at some point periodically unfreeze all your stages and do a general reoptimization of all of them to retweak them. And then when you get to the end, you have to decide whether you want to insert a series or a parallel component to represent everything that's missing. And that's uh, a bit of an experiment. In fact, on many of these circuits, I actually tried all four equivalent circuits before deciding that type one or type two was generally the, the better, the simpler of, of the circuits. Um, okay, thank you. Yes. Hello. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, I have one another question. Uh, that uh, how the equipment. Uh, Shyam, I'm sorry. I we're going by raised hand, raising hands. Uh, so please hello? raise your hand. Uh, Shyam, please. Uh, well, uh, go ahead. Ask your question. Hello, sir. Yes. Go uh, ahead. Ask your I, question. I, I want to know that how the equivalent circuit of an array can be modeled. Means, I, yeah, if suppose this is a two element uh, array, uh, and that uh, means uh, the, uh, how the gap between these two element means the air gap between these two element uh, can be designed uh, in uh, equivalent, equivalent circuit. Okay, that problem can be, can be handled. The problems I talked about tonight is how to design a one port network that fits a, a self-impedance, a driving point function or a self-impedance. Uh, the problem you're describing, we require uh, at least a two-port network to represent the two antennas in the array. And actually it needs to be a three-port network because one port will be space and then the other two will be the two feed points. So it's, it's a generalization of everything I showed tonight. Uh, and it's not something I can, I can just explain quickly, but it requires working with matrix equations instead of scalar equations and treating it as a, uh, a multi-port network synthesis problem. Um, but all the techniques I showed tonight are the, are the grounds to get you going. We have about a one minute left. Thank you, uh, doctor. I was just gonna wrap up. Uh, and so I uh, wanna show my screen. I wanna thank you, Dr. Stearns and invite you back uh, to an MTT uh, in the future where uh, we can uh, do a better job of, of hosting you. And, I, and again, I apologize to the APS chairs, officers, uh, and, uh, and thank you for your understanding, all, all, of, all of those who've hung on to, the, to this talk. So just want to remind uh, y'all that uh, next month's talk will uh, open for registration soon. Look for that and uh, on LinkedIn or Eventbrite or by email distribution of MTT. And uh, what I would uh, ask is that uh, you consider joining the IEEE and the Microwave Theory and Technique Society or the Antennas and Propagation Society. I belong to both and I've found it over my 
I suppose, 36 years of membership, uh, it's been well worth it. So again, thank you all. And thank you, Dr. Stearns and, and, uh, and, and the APS uh, team and the MTT team. Bye for now. Good night. Good night.